Hi, my name is Sarah Fisher. I'm a media reporter with Axios. I'm here in the Stagwell Lounge here at CAM, and we wanted to talk to Mark Penn, the CEO and chairman of Stagwell. But before we get started, Mark, can you just walk us through what Stagwell is, where you all are located? I know it's global, but and what the things are that you're focused on doing. Well, Stagwell today is about 12,000 marketers in 34 countries uh, across digital transformation, media and, and targeting, research and insights, and incredible creativity and communications. And I think what we've tried to do is build a digital first, you know, marketing services company that really works for the modern marketer. And we've come a long way in just a few years here. I mean, Mark, I was laying you up to say you're based in my hometown of Washington, D.C. Well, I'm based, in, I'm based in D.C. A lot of us are in, are in New York, L.A., Miami, Amsterdam, London, and at least for this week, uh, more almost every agency this year is here in Cannes having some really incredible meetings. Well, I love having Mark here with me in D.C. when I'm there. Um, thank you so much. One of the big trends I'm hearing this year that I didn't hear before the pandemic is a huge emphasis on e-commerce and retail. Walk me through what you're seeing in that regard. Is it a lot more retail companies coming to Can, or is it that the traditional brands are just trying to think about how they get in touch with those retail companies? Well, remember what happened during the pandemic is there was a three to five year speed up of adaptation of online shopping. And even if now people are beginning to pull back a little bit and say, oh, okay, I can go to the store now. Uh, on the other hand, every company is saying, you know what, maybe we didn't fully develop that e-commerce channel or that DTC channel. Maybe we need one. Maybe this has to be integrated now in terms of an operation. We used to do all brand marketing and drive people to the stores. Now maybe we're going to do kind of half performance marketing, half brand, half a DTC channel. Stagwell just acquired Brand New Galaxy, uh, an e-commerce company based in Poland. We've added that to our kind of media stream so that people can, you know, once you get into e-commerce, you got thousands and thousands of pieces of content and we have to get the right pieces of content to you in line with what you're, what you're interested in, otherwise it's kind of a waste of time. So you definitely have to have a lot of expertise to be doing something like that, creating all the different type of content. One of the things that I saw last time we were here in Cannes, in this very room actually, was that you had so many companies rise to the top, whether they were digital disruptor brands or digital disruption agencies like Stagwell, because they had expertise in this. Now fast forward, some of the disrupted are becoming disruptors. They've watched how those companies with expertise have evolved and have gained, and so they themselves are starting to invest in those types of tools, technologies, data, et cetera. How are the established companies now becoming very bit much disruptors, both in e-commerce, but also just in digitization, quite frankly? Well, look, you, you have to look in general at marketing itself to see how it's disrupted and changed. So when you go back to 2000, uh, approximately 35% of marketing dollars were spent on TV mm -hmm. and 33% on newspaper advertising. Wow. Now we're at the stage where 51% is spent online, 27% is spent on TV. Wow. So now if I am a CMO of an organization that has to do that, that means I don't start with an ad and placing it on the Super Bowl or you know general media anymore. I start with an understanding of first party data, how I analyze that data, what third party sources of data, what insights I have on that data, and only when I have that, then I can build a creative platform. And then I have to execute that creative platform against maybe 10 different mediums now. So either you are a modern marketer who has adopted that system, or you're stuck in the past and you're struggling in some way, or life's pretty simple and easy for you, right? And, uh, you know, and, and kind of what we point out is Stagwell was built really for that new kind of marketer. And what you're seeing is the transformation of CMO, CMOs from the first kind to they were kind of in the middle, right, for a number of years. And, and now I think you're seeing CMOs adopt the whole process 100% and that that really is at every level with every company. So is it fair to say that the CMO needs to be kind of like the CIO at the same time? Well, I, think, I don't think that a C, CMO has to be a complete techie, right? I think that a CMO has to be comfortable enough with both data and creativity. Mm. Uh, because if you're all data and no creativity, you'll be beaten by someone who really has the right balance. And again, a lot of my philosophy at Stagwell 
is that, look, you could 2x a campaign with good creative, you could 2x a campaign with good targeting, and you could 2x a campaign with good you know, media placement, and that means you can 8x a campaign where you hit all three of those. Right? If you just do one piece well. So that makes, that's why CMOs have a harder job than ever, right? because you just can't be skilled in what's great creative and going to win an award at, here at Con, and you just can't be a kind of a, a pure data geek who doesn't really care about the, about the art of advertising because you'll be beaten by a brand that just comes along and then kind of sweeps the hearts and minds of the public. Totally hear you on CMOs have a harder job than ever. I think the latest data I saw is that the length of tenure for a CMO is shorter than it's ever been historically, which is just outstanding. Thinking about how you are migrating your entire business for this new reality, you mentioned something which was interesting to me, which is first party data. You know, it used to be that everyone would come to CAN and talk about their third party data solutions, retargeting solutions, mm -hmm. and marketing became obsessed with efficiencies over creative. Now that we've moved into first party data, I think we're thinking a lot more about context. Walk me through that as somebody who's spent a lot of time thinking about you know, privacy issues when you were at Microsoft, et cetera. Well, I mean, you at Axios are good generators of first party data, right? Who, who reads a story about cars versus who reads a story about entertainment or who's really gonna be interested in this interview? And I think, I think everyone starts with a realization that they have to understand who their consumer is, that if they're not doing it, that is the, the freest part of the process, right? They don't have to buy it from somebody else. It's the closest to their consumer experience. And I think they realize that, that the whole marketing flywheel has to start with an understanding of that. Now, it doesn't mean it's fixed. Your consumers could change, right? You could have a whole series of new stories that brings in new kinds of consumers. So I don't think people should get the, uh, the idea that their consumer base is a fixed set of people. Mm -hmm. Frankly, it can change as you change your product mix uh, and you can bring in new consumers. So having an understanding of kind of a flexible data-driven world, right? You create interest, that interest then gets absorbed and you, you then can, can then retarget and, and kind of create a relationship with those customers. You know, I think that's central. I think people know that. I think it's an imperfect process, um, right? Like, how many times do you get that shoe ad after you've bought the shoe? Yes. Right? And it's like, I tell them, I bought the <laughs> shoe already, okay? <clears throat> and hopefully, the AI-driven stuff here will, will start to stop giving you the, the really stupid stuff like that. Yeah. But, okay, so a challenge, though, is that until we get to the point where that AI is good enough, there's still a trust gap where I think consumers feel like the tech might be too smart, maybe a little bit creepy. And that becomes a problem as we enter into a new phase of the internet, when we're thinking about things like the metaverse and VR and AR. How do we build trust into the new world of marketing, into the new next phase of the internet, when we're not really even totally getting it right now? Yeah, I am seeing an increased problem with consumer trust uh, and tech companies and the whole process of kind of how much privacy one should have. And I think unfortunately, all of these privacy issues are being lumped together, mm -hmm. right? And, and really, people care about, say, their mail or their texts or their prescription drugs and their healthcare stuff. But whether they buy a shoe or not or eat a hamburger, they're okay with companies finding out about that and marketing to them on the basis of products that they really like. And I think we have to do a better job of differentiating that, as you say, letting people say, hey, contextual advertising based on your habits is useful to you. On the other hand, if we could draw some clear limits, we're not going to use your mail, we're not going to use your prescriptions, we're not going to use certain areas, I think that would give consumers a lot of confidence. And when they're drawing those limits, how should they be communicating to consumers? Because I know for me, I'm looking through these policy privacy things and I'm just scrolling through forever. I'm not reading yeah. the actual text. So how do you d get that message across? I think 30 page uh, documents in six point type is <laughs> the best way I know to get consumer <laughs> approval on anything. Uh, no, look, I, I think that, you know, like all things, you should have in plain type and plain language we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and then have all the type. And I think that now we've gotten into a world of kind of meaningless, quick approvals mm -hmm. that are needed all day long. You know, in Europe here, you're just saying, okay, okay, in order to see every website. And so have they really produced a productive process 
right? Am I really making a choice between the app? You know, occasionally the app could follow me always or just when I'm using it. Sometimes that's a meaningful choice. So, so we've got to get to the, to the, to the point where what's presented to the, to the consumer is a meaningful choice that they can make quickly. Or I think better yet, frankly, is consumers should make master choices. And that you shouldn't be asked about every single website and every single time you, lo you log on to one or the other. You should be able to set a profile. Here's what I'm willing to accept. Here's what I'm willing to let you track. Here's what I'm not willing to let you track. And have it applied to all comers. That'd be more efficient. I don't know why that hasn't developed yet. Well, to your point about that, we're now heading into the metaverse, as people say, the last phase of the internet. And that's where I really wanted to land this interview because thinking ahead to that point, we don't have this stuff figured out yet. And so do you feel like consumers are bullish or bearish on those next new technologies based on the fact that we don't even have the trust and safety down, quite frankly, in Web 2.0, let alone Web 3.0? Uh, I think there are some problems uh, on the surface here because I was at an Oxford Union debate on the metaverse and I've never seen before so much outright skepticism of the tech companies. Huh. So what they're really saying is, look, Web 2.0 has problems. Those problems include uh, kind of control of big tech, a feeling that maybe we're manipulated somewhat, a feeling that privacy controls are, are not real. And their assumption is not that that Web 3 is going to be better or that the metaverse is going to be better, but that it's going to be more of the same or even worse, wow. right? And, and fear of a single ownership of the metaverse and fear of what's going to happen with all the data and a fear of a greater tools of manipulation being possible in an artificial 3D world, uh, I think really puts up a lot of red flags here that, that in order to get people to go in the metaverse, we're going to have to think somewhat more about both the safety protocols, privacy, and the interoperability of it in order to gain consumer acceptance. Wow, okay, so last question for you. We work with Harris Poll, which is a Stagwell company, every year to commission data on how people feel about a lot of these companies. And one of the things that stands out to me about some of the companies going into the metaverse is that there's skepticism across the board demographically. It's not just one age group or one you know, type of rural versus urban person that feels this way. It's pretty universal. But could you give me a sense demographically of how different groups feel about these opportunities? Do you think young people are more bullish generally, or are they the ones that are the most skeptical having grown up on social media? Well, I think that, I think that the importance of young people in tech developments can't be overrated. Like, who really cares whether I'm going to go into the metaverse, right? What they really, really care about is whether, whether my children are going to make that kind of transference into the metaverse. So, so it's a practical matter. While I generally believe we should look at marketing from like 18 to, to 92, mm -hmm. in this case, mm -hmm. I think that, that even young people who are generally the most optimistic about technology now have skepticism, not about technology itself, but about the companies behind the technology. And they're going to have to do a better job. And you see, I think, I think you see Amazon and Google with pretty strong images overall. Uh, and you see Facebook and Twitter with, with incredibly decimated images. So right? just final word as we head out of here, what's your advice to those types of companies that are struggling with an image? Well, I think they're going to have to come to terms with the specific issues and do a better job of communicating the boundaries that they are not going to, going to go through and give people kind of greater assurance as we move into the next world of technology that people will have greater control both over their data and, and both over uh, a, a feeling that they're not being manipulated, that they, that they know what's what, that they know who really apps and bots are really working for and getting some, some transparency. It'll be interesting to see if Elon Musk takes over Twitter and whether he can infuse some of those principles in and whether, whether it will make a difference because when it comes to image, there's no big tech company lower than Twitter. Oof, it's a rough place to be. But Mark Penn, thank you so much for walking us through that data, walking us some, through some of the bigger trends that we're seeing here at Can. We hope you stop by the Speaker's Lounge and visit Stagwell here today. And thank you so much for joining us.